Next, we need to look at how fiscal policy works depending on the shape of aggregate supply. Remember, the major argument between Keynesians and neoclassicals is simply that aggregate supply doesn't look like what the other thinks uh, that it does look like. So it's important to see what the effects might be based on how aggregate su supply might actually look. So since this is mostly a Keynesian view, that is Keynesians are, are the ones who favor uh, changing aggregate demand to accomplish the, economic, uh, the macroeconomic objectives, let's look at the Keynesian view first. Remember, for a Keynesian, the level of full employment is not really all that well defined, but it's somewhere on the curved section. So for a deflationary gap to occur, well, then we have to be to the left of full employment. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a deflationary gap. So in the Keynesian view, a change to aggregate demand is going to lead to um, a change to national income of 600 billion all the way over. This would be 700, maybe 740 billion. So it's going to have a very large effect on national income, but the effect on price level, you can see it's less than one square. For the record, uh, when I made all the graphs that you're going to look at, uh, the starting point and the shift of aggregate demand was the exact same. I just changed how aggregate supply looked. So, you know, according to the graph, we can see how the changes would be a little bit different. So here, in the Keynesian view, you get a rather large increase to national income, plus you don't get that much of an increase to price level. Let's see what happens in the neoclassical view. In the neoclassical view, what we can see is going to happen is because this change in um, aggregate demand is occurring on aggregate supply, which has more of a slope in this case, well, because that's happening, the increase to national income is not as great as what we saw over here on the Keynesian viewpoint. Also, we can see that the change to price level is a full square now. We haven't defined exactly how much that is, but it's a full square, which is greater than what we saw in the Keynesian uh, viewpoint. Add to that the whole problem of, well, where's long run aggregate supply? Because that's a fundamental part of the neoclassical viewpoint. If long run aggregate supply is right there, well, then maybe that's OK, because we end up with long run aggregate supply, uh, or we end up with long run equilibrium at the point of Y2 at this point would be income, uh, national income at full employment. But what if, and again, this is a big part of the neoclassical view, what if the government overshoots it? And neoclassical economists tend to say that the government, they can't really control aggregate demand all that well, and they're likely to miss, they're likely to increase aggregate demand by too much. Well, if that occurs, not only are we not going to get that much of an increase in um, national income in the long run, but also we're going to end up with prices at a much higher point over here after short run aggregate supply adjusts and shift to the left. So for both of those reasons, a neoclassical would say, look, the outcome isn't as good as what you think it's going to be. Therefore, take a different course of action. For an inflationary gap, the logic is much the same. Um, again, a Keynesian would argue, well, for an inflationary, for, for us to want to reduce aggregate demand, uh, Y1 would have to be to the right of YFE. Hence, it is likely to be on the more steep portion of the Keynesian aggregate supply curve. Therefore, it's going to take a rather large decrease to, of aggregate demand to get all the way over to YFE. Now, obviously, since they don't really define where YFE is that well, then how much that change is, well, we don't really know. For a neoclassical economist, well, they're going to say, well, yeah, in this case, reducing the amount of uh, aggregate demand seems like a good idea because if we don't, well, short-run aggregate supply is going to shift up here to the, up and to the left, and we're going to be left with less uh, GDP and higher prices. So in their opinion, 
having less aggregate demand would be a good thing. But in the same way, what we have to understand, I have this little quote or this little idea about kids and ice cream. Remember, neoclassical economists believe that the government's overspending is the source of most of the problems. So if you're saying, if you ask a neoclassical economist, hey, do you think that the government should spend less? I mean, that's all that you need to ask because they're going to say, yeah. Just like if you ask a kid, you know, do you like ice cream? Well, of course they're going to say yes. So asking a neoclassical economist if they think that government spending should be reduced, well, that falls right in line with their whole philosophy. So of course, they think that's the, the right thing to do. One last point that needs to be made, and this is uh, specific to the Keynesian viewpoint. Remember, Keynesians, a lot of their theory is based on the fact that wages and prices are sticky and they won't decline. Remember, we also call this the ratchet effect. That is, it's easy to move them up, but it's hard to move them back down. So if that's true, well, then now Keynesians seem to be talking a little bit out of both sides of their mouth. On the one hand, they're saying, well, we can increase aggregate demand to, um, to, bring, to, to bring the economy up to improve national income, and we can decrease it to lower the price level. But part of their whole argument is that it's very hard to lower the price level. So, if we consider it that way, what could occur is that it would only take, instead of getting from, um, instead of having to go all the way to aggregate demand 2 to get back to YFE, it's possible that aggregate demand would only have to be lowered to 83. Because if prices are sticky, that means we're going to stay at PL1, so that means that we're going to move, as aggregate demand moves to the left, well, we're not going to get to equilibrium. Instead, we're going to find at PL1, YFE is achieved, well, when aggregate demand is only at 83. And that might seem like a good thing, like, oh, well, the government doesn't have to do that much. They don't have to cut back that much to get to YFE. Well, the problem is, is at this point PL1, we have disequilibrium. So the level of aggregate demand at PL1 is not enough to buy up all the goods and services that are being produced on the aggregate supply curve and disequilibrium is never a good situation you know go look at a past video where we just where i've discussed that previously so those are the issues that we have to keep in mind when we think about how effective a uh, change to aggregate demand via fiscal policy and later monetary policy um, how effective those changes are going to be if you have any questions, leave me a comment and I'll try to get back to them.